Welcome to the Psych Genomics Consortium uh, Worldwide Lab Meeting. I'm super pleased to have Nick Bray um, talking to us. Um, I think many of us know Nick. He's one of the Cardathians, Cardiffians, um, to rhyme with ruffian, of course. Um, and he's done a lot of really interesting work over time on functional genomics, um, particularly as it relates to psychiatric disorders um, and particularly to schizophrenia. Um, and I was chatting with Nick just before this, and there's some great stuff, uh, a, a paper basically that they're, uh, that's well underway that he's going to talk to us about today, and I certainly look forward to it. Um, and just in terms of um, what to do, if you want to ask a question, um, either put something in the chat box, um, message me, or quote, raise your hand, unquote. Um, Nick has said that he'd want to take questions probably toward the end um, after 40, 45, 50 minutes or so. Um, but if you have something pressing in the meantime, by all means, go so. But let us know. So at this point, I'll turn it over to, to Nick, and I certainly look forward to your talk, and I thank you for taking the time to, um, to give this lecture today. Please. Thank you, Pat. And um, thanks for inviting me uh, to give this talk today and hello to everyone out there. So um, today I'm going to start off by briefly uh, talking about genetic effects on gene expression. Um, I'm then going to uh, go over some of the earlier work that I've been involved with uh, exploring regulatory variation in the uh, developing brain in relation to psychiatric disorders. Uh, and then uh, for probably about half the, uh, the talk, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, a, a study uh, that's currently under review uh, where we've mapped expression QTL in the fetal brain, uh, shown them to be enriched in particular psychiatric disorders uh, and used SMR to, um, uh, to uh, identify uh, gene expression changes that uh, could mediate uh, those associations. So uh, essentially, uh, we know uh, that there's two ways uh, that genetic risk variants can impact on the gene's function and therefore uh, confer risk to a psychiatric phenotype. Uh, the most well known uh, are those that alter protein structure. So for example, uh, an amino acid change uh, or a coding sequence change resulting in an amino acid change. Uh, and then the other, uh, those that affect uh, gene regulation. So uh, for example, through effects on RNA transcription, uh, splicing or stability. Uh, now, importantly, uh, the majority of GWAS signals for complex traits are not explainable through effects on protein structure. So, for example, uh, the PGC2 uh, uh, schizophrenia paper, of course, shows that only 10 of those loci uh, could uh, risk be plausibly uh, be accounted for by uh, non-synonymous polymorphism. And therefore, almost by default, we assume uh, that effects are through effects on gene regulation. Um, but unlike um, uh, coding sequence changes where the, um, uh, the uh, effects are easily uh, predicted and, and those are easily recognized uh, through effects on amino acid sequence, uh, the effects on regulatory variants are very difficult to predict. Uh, so first, it's very difficult to discern which are the actual functional variants. Uh, of course, our uh, knowledge of the non-coding genome has greatly improved with initiatives such as ENCODE, uh, Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium, and of course more recently PsychEncode. Uh, but I think it's still fair to say that our knowledge of the non-coding genome is incomplete, complete uh, particularly uh, in relation to uh, brain tissue. Um, secondly, and probably more importantly, we need to know which genes, and in particular which transcripts of those genes, uh, which could do have very different functions uh, are affected by those variants. So essentially, which are the actual susceptibility genes? Uh, and of course, uh, uh, evidence through things like EQTL studies, also uh, 3C-based studies have shown that um, it's not always going to be the nearest gene to your uh, index SNP. And in fact, uh, this may be only the case perhaps half the time. Added to this, uh, we need to know how expression of those genes are altered. Are they upregulated or, or decreased in expression in relation to the risk variant? And obviously, that's going to be important in order to accurately model those gene expression changes, but also potentially if we therapeutically target them. Added to this, we need to know where and when these effects are exerted. Um, and this 
is obviously a complication, uh, but can uh, potentially inform our understanding uh, of the cellular and developmental nature of those conditions. So effects of vegetation variants can be specific to cell types, uh, uh, context, developmental time point. Uh, and this might be uh, through um, just the fact that your gene's not expressed in that uh, cell type, or it might be through uh, differences in the expression of the interacting trans regulators or epigenomic uh, uh, modification of that uh, region itself. Uh, so to illustrate this, imagine you've got a, uh, a polymorphism, uh, uh, a risk allele single nucleotide uh, base change uh, that uh, results in differential binding of the transcription factor. Uh, well, imagine if the uh, transcription factor is expressed in the cell, well, you'll have perhaps increased expression from the C, uh, from the T, and therefore the T allele may be having an effect in that, in that cell type. Um, in contrast, another cell type where uh, perhaps that transcription factor isn't expressed, perhaps expression of the gene is driven from uh, different regulatory elements, binding different transcription factors, or uh, that uh, region is, poly, uh, is epigenomically imprinted, uh, then that uh, uh, risk allele is essentially going to be silent. Uh, it's not going to be exerting an effect on gene expression in that cell type, and therefore it's not going to be uh, uh, partaking that cell type, it's not going to be involved in risk for the disorder, or at least the gene expression, the expression of that gene in that cell type is not going to be relevant. So this will, uh, if we can identify the cell types, developmental stages at which these variants are risk variants are active, this might help us understand the sort of cellular uh, basis and developmental uh, nature of the uh, conditions we're interested in. Um, so uh, as we know, uh, several neuropsychiatric disorders are likely to have uh, an early neurodevelopmental component most obviously uh, autism, ADHD, but uh, also uh, schizophrenia, which is the disorder that I've been particularly interested in over the years. And therefore some of the regulatory variants may be acting at this early developmental period. Uh, so in order to study this, we started collecting uh, human fetal brain tissue about seven, eight years ago um, through the Human Developmental Biology Resource. Uh, and this is a um, human uh, tissue bank. Uh, it's uh, based at the Institute of Child Health in London, uh, also Newcastle University, um, funded by the Wellcome Trust uh, and Medical Research Council. Um, the, uh, samples are provided through elective terminations with consent uh, for medical research. Uh, uh, the tissue bank has uh, ethical approval for storage and distribution of these samples. Um, uh, for research. Um, one sort of downside is the samples received, or most of them uh, received, have been received frozen and undissected, and it's been quite difficult to just discern regions. And so essentially, uh, our measures are from uh, sort of whole brain homogenates. Uh, but a, a big advantage of this resource is that we've been able to amass a very large collection, a relatively large collection, um, with over 200 independent samples collected to date, which then allows us, of course, to test uh, genotypic effects of common risk variants. Um, so I'm now going to go on to some earlier work uh, that I've been involved with using these samples in relation to psychiatric disorder, uh, starting off with work uh, that I uh, did once uh, whilst I was at King's College London Institute of Psychiatry, uh, and this is with um, uh, uh, Matt Hill, who was working with me at the time. Um, so this is, uh, first of all, talk about variation, uh, assessing variation in ZNF-A24A. Uh, this was the first work we did with this, uh, this sample. Uh, and as I'm sure most of you will know, this was uh, the site of the uh, first variant to, uh, to show genome-wide significant association with psychosis. So schizophrenia, bipolar disorder uh, combined. And this uh, was out in 2008, so it's a pre-PGC consortium involving uh, uh, many people from Cardiff, but also uh, probably many of you out there. Um, and the variant, uh, so the variant was uh, a non-coding variant in an intron uh, of this gene, so uh, not predicted to affect uh, the coding sequence of the gene, the amino acid sequence, uh, and therefore uh, may uh, affect or would be expected to affect uh, the, the regulation of ZNF-A248 or perhaps another gene in the region. 
added to this, at the time the function of Z1F1840A was entirely unknown. Um, so we set about uh, exploring the effects of that variant on expression of zmf 84 expression in uh, adult brain, uh, starting um, with, uh, uh, well, in adult brain, uh, dorsal from prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, and chordate. I haven't shown chordate, but uh, essentially a very similar pattern. Uh, and for this, we use the allele specific expression method, a uh, method I've used uh, for, for many years. Uh, and this method specifically to uh, detect cis effects on gene expression. So these are the, uh, this is the mechanism by which your variant will be operating on its, on its primary target, the susceptibility gene. Um, and it achieves this by comparing the expression of each allele within individual samples. So it's a within subject measure where you're essentially uh, controlling for the trans factors that would influence both alleles to the same extent uh, whilst exposing those cis uh, uh, cis variants. Uh, and what you're looking for is a uh, allelic expression imbalance, uh, distortion in any cDNA sample, which is then indicative of a cis regulatory variant. Uh, so you can see in adult brain that compared with genomic DNA, uh, the one to one ratio, which you'd expect, um, you see a, a, a distortion in cDNA, which is uh, uh, essentially showing that there are cis regulatory variants operating on zmf 84 in adult brain. Uh, however, when we uh, stratified according to those that were homozygous or heterozygous for the risk variant, we found no significant effect. And that was the same for uh, all three adult brain regions. Uh, so from this, we took that um, essentially, although there is cis regulatory variation operating on uh, uh, zmf 84 in adult brain, it's not attributable uh, to the risk variant. Now, uh, given that schizophrenia is considered to be at least in part a neurodevelopmental disorder, we then looked in fetal brain, uh, starting with first trimester. Uh, and here we saw that uh, in contrast to the adult brain region, so it's very, the cDNA uh, ratios were very tightly uh, um, wrapped around the one-to-one -one allele ratio, indicating that cis regulatory variants aren't active at this early developmental stage. In contrast, when we looked at uh, second trimester fetal brain, we saw uh, a, a quite a wide range of allele ratios in cDNA. Uh, and moreover, we saw a significant difference in uh, allele ratios between homozygotes and heterozygotes. So the heterozygotes uh, uh, showing the, the risk allele associated with reduced allelic expression. So this tells us that the, uh, that the risk alleles associated with reduced zmf 84 expression, perhaps specifically uh, in uh, uh, second trimester fetal brain, uh, and as such, uh, provide some of the first evidence for a uh, direct evidence for a molecular risk mechanism uh, for schizophrenia uh, operating uh, during prenatal brain development. Um, so, of course, uh, gene expression changes are um, uh, amenable to uh, cellular modelling uh, through a variety of uh, uh, methods. Um, so we decided to uh, sort of mimic this effect of uh, reduced developmental expression uh, uh, of ZNF-85, uh, so 84A, uh, in human neural progenitor cells. Uh, so a, a relevant cell line derived from uh, human fetal brain uh, using RNA interference. Uh, and you can see here we had uh, very good transfection efficiency uh, and knocked down about 20, 30%, so mimicking that um, uh, effect of the risk allele. Uh, now we wanted to keep um, the uh, experiments sort of genome wide. Uh, so uh, we did a, a global uh, analysis of gene expression using microarray, um, sort of hypothesis free approach, uh, and then uh, looked uh, at enrichment, potential enrichment in particular uh, gene ontology uh, uh, terms. Uh, and what we found was an enrichment in uh, the cell adhesion term uh, uh, and with most significant changes uh, uh, seen for those genes involved in neuro outgrowth. So this gave us the first clues to ZNF-84A function, uh, but more importantly, how that reduced expression in fetal brain may be conferring risk to schizophrenia. Um, this was taken on by our colleagues, uh, uh, Dupatrick Vasava and, uh, and Michael Deans, uh, who showed that in neuronal cultures derived from these human neural progenitor cells, uh, ZNF-84 brain knockdown indeed uh, reduced neuro outgrowth and dendritic branching. So you can see how we went from a, 
uh, a non an anonymous non-coding variant in a gene of unknown function uh, through to a molecular risk mechanism uh, 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 reduced xenophytic for expression in fetal brain uh, through to uh, pleased to how that might operate uh, and ultimately uh, to a potential physiological risk mechanism. So that's obviously uh, a very in-depth um, uh, study of a particular uh, a single uh, risk locus, but we're now um, in a position where we've got um, hundreds of well-supported uh, risk loci, so we can ask much more general uh, uh, questions of those data. So uh, the next bit of uh, data I'll discuss is work led by my, um, uh, my collaborators, John Mill and Eilish Hannon at Exeter University, um, who uh, looked at uh, genetic effects on DNA methylation uh, in the uh, developing human brain. So um, uh, DNA methylation is of course um, probably the most well studied epigenetic modification, uh, typically occurring at cytosine residues, uh, where it's associated usually with uh, uh, transcriptional repression through recruitment of methyl binding proteins. So this work um, largely started um, in, uh, uh, through work by one of mine and John's PhD students, Helen Spears, uh, who performed a genome-wide analysis of DNA methylation uh, in the fetal brain. She took 160 samples, so that all the first trimester samples and, and some, some more additional samples uh, and second trimester samples. Um, DNA methylation assessed through uh, uh, 450k arrays uh, and what she was looking for was uh, changes in uh, methylation across brain development and she also reported sex differences in uh, DNA methylation. Um, we then went on to genome-wide genotype these samples, uh, which allowed Eilish Hannon uh, to analyze and identify uh, uh, DNA methylation QTLs uh, within these fetal brain samples. And she found 16,000 uh, uh, such uh, methylation QTLs at Bonferroni corrected significance. Um, so some of these um, uh, methylation QTLs uh, were fetal specific, and you can see an example here of one of those, uh, but many uh, were shared with adult uh, brain tissues. Um, but perhaps more interestingly, or for us, um, she found uh, that uh, schizophrenia GWAS risk variants uh, were enriched among fetal MQTL. So this is the PGC2 schizophrenia data. Um, uh, she tested at, I think, four different p-value, GWAS p-value thresholds, finding consistent enrichment of uh, the methylation, fetal methylation QTLs at each uh, threshold, I think averaging about fourfold. Uh, so this tells us that, um, that regulatory variation, genetic regulatory variation, operational in fetal brain is of general relevance to schizophrenia uh, etiology. Um, Eilish also showed that um, methylation QTLs can help refine GWAS risk loci. So this is uh, a well-known, of course, uh, region on chromosome 10, uh, one of the top uh, regions for uh, schizophrenia, uh, also came up in the cross disorders um, analysis. Um, this extensive uh, linkage to equilibrium, stretching about um, half a megabase um, and encompassing uh, about four uh, known protein coding genes any of which could be the actual susceptibility genes. Uh, and of course, it could be mediated uh, alternatively or in addition by uh, uh, long range effects on genes uh, outside of this area. Um, and so what I showed that was, although, was that although the, um, the genetic association spanned that whole region, uh, effects of the risk variant on uh, methylation were really only significant at one uh, probe and that probe mapped to AS3MT. Um, at around about the same time, one of my PhD students at King's, uh, Rodrigo Duarte, had shown that, um, that this variant is indeed associated with uh, quite pronounced allelic expression distortion of AS3MT uh, in uh, fetal brain as well as adult brain uh, regions uh, with the risk allele associated with increased AS3MT expression. Uh, and this, of course, has been picked up by uh, several other groups, um, in particular, uh, uh, Danny Weiberger and the Liebler Institute, who implicated particular 
AS3MT transcript. So um, for the next uh, part of the talk, the remainder of the talk, I'm going to um, describe in some depth um, a study that, um, that I started actually at King's, um, uh, an MRC funded project uh, that I brought with me uh, to uh, Cardiff. Uh, and through that, we've mapped expression QTL in the fetal brain, uh, as shown that these are enriched in certain psychiatric disorders. And as I say, uh, we've been able to implicate particular uh, gene expression changes in those conditions. Um, this is, uh, the, the analysis was all or largely done um, by Heath O'Brien, a really brilliant postdoc working with me, um, uh, and with uh, additional analysis by Eilish Hammond in Exeter. And as I say, this paper's uh, currently under review. So um, for this study, we um, focused on uh, tissue from second trimester, uh, 120 second trimester fetal brains. We decided that this uh, was probably the, um, uh, sort of a, an age that would be more, most relevant to psychiatric uh, disorders. This uh, 120 included about 80 that were included in the bomb throat, that's uh, in the methylation array uh, data. Uh, but this uh, included another 40 uh, that we, um, we obtained uh, for this project. Um, the total RNA was um, uh, used for, uh, to generate whole transcriptome RNA-seq libraries. So it's uh, ribosomal RNA depletion, uh, followed by uh, Illumina uh, TrueSeq libraries based on uh, random cDNA priming. Um, we then very deeply sequenced these, li uh, these libraries uh, on high seq, uh, generating at least 50 million read pairs per sample. Um, and then he used Callisto to align these reads uh, to individual ensemble transcripts, uh, which then uh, he then summated at the uh, gene level. So from this, he, we, we were able to obtain uh, expression measures for uh, 144,000 individual. Uh, RNA transcripts annotated uh, to about 29,000 genes. Um, so following uh, GTEx or the latest GTEx 2017 paper, we modelled a lot of this on their uh, methodology. Uh, we used um, peer uh, probabilistic estimation of uh, expression residuals uh, to control for latent factors uh, as well as specified uh, variables such as RIN, sex, age, and batch, and genotyping principal components. And you can see here um, that uh, it did a pretty good job of uh, homogenizing uh, the total gene expression levels. Uh, so you can see in, in pale blue the uncorrected expression from the 120 samples, uh, and then uh, in uh, dark blue we have the, um, uh, the samples uh, once they've been controlled for the peer factors and other specified variables. So uh, the EQTO analysis, well, the genotyping uh, was done using uh, Omni Express array, so directly genotyped for about 700,000 SNPs. Uh, after QC, uh, we then um, imputed from the HRC uh, a few million, well, many million more. Uh, and after strict QC, uh, 5.8 million uh, these SNPs were retained for the analysis. Um, again, following uh, the GTEx consortium, we need fast, e uh, fast QTL um, uh, to map the SISI QTL, uh, which are arbitrarily defined as variants within one megabase of the regulated gene. Uh, so, um, fast QTL um, is yeah, essentially what they use rather than matrix QTL, and it seems that this may be um, uh, better for controlling the false discovery rate. Um, so uh, from this, we uh, found high confidence EQTL. So those with a false discovery rate of less than 5% uh, for about 1,300 genes, which are called E-genes, uh, and 3,252 individual ensemble transcripts, which are called E-transcripts. Uh, and this is a similar number uh, to what GTEx found in their analysis in similar size samples. So uh, in the 100, about 100 frontal cortex samples included in that analysis, they found about 1,500 uh, e-genes at 5% FDR. 
So consistent with um, uh, earlier EQTL studies, we found that they uh, are significant EQTL uh, are very much concentrated in proximity to the regulated gene, uh, with the vast majority occurring within 150 kb either, either side of the transcription start site. Um, we also uh, looked for enrichment of those significant EQTL uh, in different uh, uh, functional annotations, epigenomic annotations uh, described by ENCODE and Roadmap Epigenomics Project in six human cell lines. Uh, and consistent with um, the, this data here, we found a high, high a strong enrichment in uh, the transcription start site, obviously also the promoter, uh, but also enhancers uh, and weak enhancers. Uh, but interestingly, uh, we found significant, de uh, uh, significant depletion in regions that were uh, annotated as repressed. Um, so Heath noticed that many of the EQTL that um, he found were mapping to a particular region uh, uh, on 17Q21, ostensibly uh, through linkage to equilibrium. Uh, and we found that this was uh, in fact the site of a, a common inversion uh, that's uh, described uh, here uh, by decode uh, with about 20% frequency in European. So this is the MAP-T locus, you probably all know, the H1 haplotype, uh, which is a non-inverted uh, form, has been um, implicated in uh, various neurodegenerative conditions, whereas the, uh, uh, the inverted form, the H2 haplotype, uh, it seems to um, be tagged by SNPs um, associated uh, in recent studies of neuroticism. Um, so we found um, uh, that about 21 of the genes, of our e-genes, map to this particular region, the inversion. Um, for the 13 of these genes, uh, the actual inversion itself um, was pretty much tag tagged the, um, the top EQTL, so that could be explained there. And this is the R squared uh, between our top EQTL and a SNP that um, defines the inversion. You can see here uh, genes like CANZEL1, LRRC37A are very strongly uh, tagged by uh, the inversion. Um, whereas others, such as NSF uh, uh, and, and others down here, um, less so, uh, suggesting, and I think this is possibly because of polymorphic duplication uh, at the edges of the uh, inversion, or potentially also uh, regulatory variants that have arisen uh, independently on the H1 or H2 haplotypes. Um, we also looked at sharing of fetal brain EQTL uh, in adult tissues using um, uh, data from the GTEx consortia. So um, GTEx uh, analyzed 48 uh, uh, adult tissues uh, and we use their meta, meta tissue uh, analysis, which is essentially a meta analysis uh, uh, that gives you M values, which is uh, essentially posterior probability that your EQTL is shared with a given tissue. Uh, and what you can see here from the heat map is that our significant fetal uh, e-gene, this is all e-gene because that's how uh, GTEx uh, analyzed their data, the EQTL are, are shared um, with um, a, large a large proportion of our EQTL are shared uh, with um, adult uh, tissues. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, no, sorry, uh, I'll leave my mouse alone. Um, you can see a large block of uh, sharing here, uh, and these are adult brain regions, as you might expect, where about on average, 80% of our fetal EQTL appear to be shared. Um, down here, you see less uh, sharing. Uh, this is the least uh, uh, tissue that sh shares fetal EQTL, the least, that's blood, where I think about 40% of our fetal EQTL were predicted to be shared. Um, but of course, the main reason for us to doing this um, uh, project was to uh, better understand uh, genetic risk factors for psychiatric disorders, the mechanism by which they operate. And so, uh, first of all, we uh, tested enrichment of GWAS risk variants for various psychiatric disorders and uh, non-brain disorders uh, within fetal EQTL. And for this, we use Garfield, which is uh, currently preprint 
uh, 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 paper uh, that tests enrichment whilst controlling for uh, local gene density, uh, allele frequency, and linkage to equilibrium. Um, for this, we focused on transcript uh, CIS-EQTL because this largely encompassed uh, the gene CIS-EQTL and uh, potentially also indexes more subtle regulatory variations such as slicing uh, variants and uh, transcript specific promoters uh, that may be more or may be relevant to complex traits, probably very relevant to complex traits. Um, the GWAS data sets were essentially from, from you, from PGC uh, data largely. Uh, so we tested seven neuropsychiatric phenotypes, ADHD, uh, anorexia, ASD, bipolar disorder, MDD, uh, personality trait of neuroticism and schizophrenia. And this is the Pardinas data set. So that's PGC2 plus the latest plus UK. And um, we compared uh, uh, this with GWAS data for five non-brain phenotypes that have a similar uh, number of genome-wide significant uh, loci. Uh, so body max, uh, mass index, coronary artery disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, height, and type 2 diabetes. And we looked at four uh, different GWAS p-value thresholds. Uh, we looked at 12 traits. Uh, and so here I show those uh, traits where uh, enrichment at, at one threshold, at least one threshold, survived correction, uh, bomb for any correction for those uh, 48 tests, so essentially uh, p-value of 0 0.001. Um, so at the top here, we've got the log 10 p-value. The dotted line is the uh, essentially the threshold bomb for any correction threshold, uh, and each, uh, uh, each of the four p-value thresholds, 10 to the minus 5, uh, up to five times 10 to the minus eight. Um, at the bottom, you have uh, the enrichment expressed in terms of uh, natural log of the odds ratio with 95% confidence intervals for the error bars. Uh, and you can see here that uh, consistent with it being a neurodevelopmental disorder, we saw uh, enrichment in ADHD, and that's uh, was about 11 fold, essentially 11 fold enrichment across uh, the uh, four thresholds. Uh, so, as I say, consistent with that being neurodevelopmental, but also pointing to a fetal neurodevelopmental element to that. Uh, similarly, schizophrenia, uh, we found enrichment there, consistent with the neurodevelopmental hypothesis of that uh, disorder. Um, interestingly, we also found similar levels of enrichment for bipolar disorder, which of course is less commonly conceptualized as uh, neurodevelopmental in origin, uh, and also uh, uh, enrichment for uh, uh, variants associated with inflammatory bowel disease, suggesting a neurodevelopmental association uh, with that condition. Um, so we then went on uh, to use summary-based Mendelian randomization uh, to identify gene expression changes that were pleiotropically associated uh, with uh, the uh, these disorders using the same uh, GWAS uh, data sets that I described earlier. Um, we did this uh, or limited it to genes and transcripts where there were EQTL of 5%, uh, sorry, 5% FDR. So essentially our E genes and E transcripts, the 1300 E genes, 3000 odd E transcripts, and we corrected uh, or only uh, report those that survived correction for that uh, number of, of tests. Um, consistent with the original study, we also only report those uh, where the uh, P for the HIDE test uh, exceeded uh, 0.05, uh, indicating that, uh, that the um, association wasn't due to linkage between the EQTL and the GWAS uh, variants. So, as I say, we looked at the summated gene level as well as the individual transcripts. Uh, at the summated gene level, uh, we saw a handful of gene expression changes associated with uh, schizophrenia, um, uh, including sort of long non-coding RNAs, uh, but also this TSPG4P11, which was implicated uh, in schizophrenia uh, through an SMR study of Halberg and colleagues uh, using uh, the CMC adult brain uh, data. 
Um, also ABCB9, uh, which is again implicating schizophrenia by Halberg uh, using tissue and blood. And I think that also came up in the original zoo study um, uh, in blood. Um, for bipolar disorder, we found association with this uh, leucine rich repeat containing gene. Uh, and that might be of interest given the known role of, uh, role of those genes in uh, formation of excitatory inhibitory synapses. Um, for neuroticism, we saw uh, several genes on chromosome 17 associated with risk for that, including most significantly uh, another leucine rich repeat containing gene, um, but also Kanzel one and others. Um, at the uh, individual transcript level, uh, we found um, a large number of associations. And, and for this, I've only listed uh, the, the, the most significant transcript for a given gene uh, so that I could fit it all on one slide. Um, so for schizophrenia, we'll see that the, the uh, transcript uh, showing strongest association uh, with schizophrenia is uh, C4A, uh, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. Um, also, we found association at, uh, at GNL3, um, which was also associated with bipolar disorder, seemingly through the same uh, risk variant, um, uh, with increased expression of this transcript and association with both disorders. Uh, GNL3 uh, picked up, um, uh, of course, in the recent uh, uh, TWAS paper, Gustav and colleagues uh, in, uh, in brain. Uh, KLC1. Uh, again, picked up uh, by, uh, uh, by the TWAS of Gusev uh, through a splicing, I think a splicing QTL uh, in the CMC data. Um, again, uh, some uh, ABCB9, uh, as well as some novel genes there for schizophrenia. Uh, for neuroticism, again, many mapping to chromosome 17, uh, but also another one uh, here, uh, mapping to chromosome 2 or Four, uh, and then anorexia and MDD, uh, both uh, associated with ribosomal protein uh, subunits. Um, so uh, for schizophrenia, we found risk associated with um, C4A expression, increased C4A expression. And you can see here that the GWAS effect sizes in the uh, Pardinas data set uh, very nicely correlate with the EQTL effect sizes in our fetal uh, brain, um, as I say, with increased expression of C4A in association with the, with the risk variant. Of course, this is of interest given this, uh, this really great paper from Stephen Carroll's group, uh, where they showed that, um, uh, that uh, risk or some of the risk at the uh, MHC locus on chromosome 6 for schizophrenia is attributable to copy number variants encompassing the C4 gene uh, giving rise to different numbers of C4A uh, and B uh, with uh, increased expression of C4A in the adult brain associated uh, with risk for schizophrenia. Um, CCAR and colleagues also showed that um, C4A is expressed in, um, in human neurons uh, where it may mark out uh, synapses for uh, synaptic pruning uh, during adolescence, so serving as that second hit. Um, our data, of course, by showing that this mechanism is, is essentially uh, operational in the fetal brain and we confirmed expression of C4A and B in uh, fetal brain regions using RT-PCR, uh, in showing uh, that this is uh, an effect in fetal brain, we uh, suggest that this pathogenic uh, process may start even earlier, uh, perhaps as an initial uh, hit uh, during this initial stage of uh, synaptic refinement. So um, all the data uh, for this study uh, uh, are available through a Figshare depository. Uh, they'll be available here um, with publication of the study, which hopefully won't be too long. Uh, but if people uh, need the data now, I'm uh, happy uh, to share, so please get in touch. Uh, so we have uh, all EQTLs at the gene uh, and transcript level, as well as um, expression levels at the gene and transcript level uh, and top EQTLs uh, for, for all of those as well. So as I say, get in touch if you need those data before that and we can uh, work something out. I'll be in uh, Glasgow next month uh, so we can discuss things there if you'd like as well. Um, 
So, uh, and obviously we'll be using this uh, now, we're keen to use this now uh, in uh, relation to the PGC3 schizophrenia data set. So, um, to summarise, uh, it's now clear that most common risk variants for psychiatric disorders, as well as other complex conditions, operate through altered gene regulation. Uh, and our data suggests that some of these, um, so for example, those for schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, ADHD, appear to be active uh, in the prenatal uh, brain. Now, many of these are shared with adult tissues, uh, but I think that the fact that they're um, active at this early uh, stage fetal brain uh, suggests that they may at least start during this early uh, time point. Um, and we've used SMR to implicate expression changes at both the transcript and gene level. Uh, some of these are uh, seen in adult brain and reported by others uh, and some novel. Uh, and I think uh, these may warrant neurobiological in investigation, perhaps akin to the sort of uh, study that we did uh, for ZNF-A24A uh, and, other, and other genes actually that we haven't mentioned today. Um, of course, uh, it's probably obvious to you that we've only scratched the surface here. Uh, and so increased sample size is likely to yield many more fetal brain uh, EQTL uh, with consequent uh, uh, improvements to our power to relate those to psychiatric disorders. Um, so I'd like to finish there um, and, and thank a number of people uh, at Cardiff University. Uh, I'd like to particularly thank Heath O'Brien, uh, who, as I said, did all the um, analysis or primary analysis for the EQTL uh, study. Um, Matt Hill, who started with me, at, uh, was, well, was with me um, at King's, uh, has been in various places, including uh, Dublin, uh, uh, but is now a PI himself in Cardiff. Uh, of course, Mick and Mike and others at Cardiff, and it's great uh, working back with them again. Um, at Exeter, a particular thanks to my great collaborators and friends, Eilish and John uh, and others. Uh, King's College, um, I'd like to thank Gemma for making uh, many of the libraries, also Rodrigo, my PhD student, and others uh, I worked with. Uh, um, of course, a very huge, huge thanks to you out there, the working groups of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium and iPsych for uh, the summary data with which, uh, which we used for our, um, uh, our EQTL study, um, the HDBR uh, for providing tissue, and of course the donors themselves, uh, the MRC for funding all my research, uh, and, uh, and thank you, and yeah, thank you to everyone for listening to me today. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for, um, for the lovely presentation, and, and also for your generosity in actually being willing to make these data available ahead of publication. That's, that's yeah. fantastic, especially given how difficult um, much this work is to do. Yeah. Um, so for the audience, um, we've got a, a good deal of time for questions. Yeah. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Um, Nick, down at the bottom of your screen, there's something that says Q&A. If you mm -hmm. click on it and then go to open questions, um, you'll see one from David Curtis. If you don't find it in a moment, I'll read it to you. Oh, okay. Q&A. Hi, David. Okay. Um, just wondered if you to see if any expression changes are associated with schizophrenia PRS. Yeah, yes, I, yes, I looked at this in the CMC data set, but couldn't find any specific genes where PRS predicted expression. Yeah, I, um, I saw your paper, actually, it was something that I've been thinking about for a long time, and I actually raised it um, with Pat and others, and then someone found your paper, at the time I think it was on, um, uh, on BioArchive, but I know it's now published. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is, a, you know, on, in principle, a brilliant idea to see if essentially collectively your variants are, are acting sort of collectively through a particular pathway. Um, it's unfortunate you didn't find anything in adult brain. Um, we haven't, we were intending uh, to uh, look at it. I don't, we haven't really looked at it properly. It's, it's, uh, so, um, so we will look at it properly, hopefully, um, soon, but we haven't, we haven't done it yet. Did you hear that, anyone? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, okay. you're, you're live. And, so people and thank, you. thank you, David. And David said, cool, thanks. So it's all good. Um, I have a question. Um, you know, one of the things that 
is a potential use for EQTL data, although the practicalities are quite tricky, is to look for um, more distal EQTLs. Obviously, mm -hmm. the, the one megabase thing is a fiction. It's a, just a, you know, it's a convenient thing that everybody yeah. uses, but I don't think anybody believes it. So yeah. the question for you is, did you guys look for, for more distal effects? Using the fast QTL, we just kept it as the one megabase. Um, we didn't look at conditional EQTL either, which is something that probably we would have quite liked um, to have done. Um, we didn't look at, or at least um, Heath didn't show me the data for the trans EQTL. I was quite keen to also map trans EQTL, which you can't do, I believe, with fast QTL. You have to use matrix QTL. Um, uh, obviously, with mapping trans QTL, you have a problem that there's far more uh, tests. Uh, and so I was keen to limit it to only those cis EQTLs that had an FDR of 5%, because obviously your variant has to be operating through a gene in cis, be that through affecting their protein structure or their expression in order for them to have a trans effect. Um, he did do that and he did tell me that he had a lot of genes, about 400 genes, uh, but given that uh, GTEx had done this and then I think he was worried that it could have been due to mapping, uh, essentially mapping, false mapping of, uh, of uh, reads that should have gone to the, to the cis gene uh, mapping elsewhere in the genome. Uh, and so he um, was going to address that. Um, I don't think he fully addressed it to his satisfaction. So, um, so he didn't let me look at them, but I would be very interested in them, even though GTEx only essentially, when they did all these controls, I think they only really uh, found about sort of three per tissue. Um, but I think that's something, again, that we should, uh, should investigate and maybe something that we could do in relation to PGC3. Thank okay. you. And there's a question from Johnny Coleman. There appeared to be a correlation between the number of EQTLs associated with the gene and the association of that gene with the chromosome 17 inversion. Is that relevant? How do you interpret that? Yeah, so, um, so when I looked at the, um, the uh, number of associated with the association, uh, yeah, okay, so yeah, the, um, it looks like there's there's incredibly strong linkage to equilibrium across that whole inversion. So, um, so I think the inversion is that, yeah, the, um, you know, if there is a, 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 an EQTL that, that is perfectly tagged by that, um, by that inversion, then it will stretch um, across the whole, um, that whole uh, 900 kilobases or, or thereabouts. Is that, is that what you've asked? Um, following on from Johnny's question, did, did you actually drill down to see whether there was anything distinctive about any of the large pathogenic CNV regions? I know the individuals in the study are probably copy number two, but for example, did you find anything different about 22Q11 in terms of the EQTL pattern? We, we didn't really look, to tell you the truth. Um, yeah, that's something probably we should have done. We, it was a, a simple uh, uh, a simple EQTL uh, study, and this was uh, some of them, but we should go back and look at the chromosome uh, 22 stuff. And then Johnny noted that that answered his question. Oh, thank you, thank you. So no open questions, so let me ask uh, another one if I may. Yes. What's next, Nick? What's, your, what's the next study that you'd like to gear up to do, or what do you think is the obvious follow-on from this? Um, well, uh, as I say, I'd like to apply this to PGC3 data. Um, the next, well, there's two things. There's something that I've, a study that we've already done that I presented uh, last year at World Congress, which is uh, looking, which isn't a follow on from this. It was something that we did sort of before this um, as what we thought might be just a, a, a quick uh, look to see that might, that might be of interest. And that's looking at sex differences in gene expression. Um, mm. We found um, a good, a give, especially well, given uh, the sex biases in uh, various neurodevelopmental disorders like ADHD and autism and things. So, um, 
So we found a, a very large number of sex bias genes um, and we've got a, a, um, a, a web, it's a, a, a shiny app where you can search for uh, the set, essentially search for any gene. So if you're interested in well, any, any gene in, in, in fetal brain, it will give you that expression pattern, but it'll also tell you whether it's differentially expressed between males and females. So that's something that, um, that we'll be um, resubmitting um, uh, soon and that data set will be available and again I can share that data set with everyone um, and I can uh, people can have that link and they can look at their genes. Um, the next I think in terms of gene expression um, the next serious thing to be doing would be I think um, TWAS association based on this uh, because of course uh, we know that you know, eQtl based on the individual, and this comes back to the conditional as well, might not be detecting everything, a kind of haplotypic effect uh, may um, better capture uh, the eQtls in, in a gene. Um, what I think I'd really like to do is, a hapl is essentially a TWAS weights based on allele specific expression where you're only exposing uh, the cis regulatory variation. So that might be a very powerful approach, although it might only be applicable to a subset of genes. Um, so, um, so yeah, and of course, increasing the sample size. So, you know, with um, GTEx, they've shown that, and we all know from, from the PGC, that adding more samples to anything, um, but for the GTEx, uh, going from, say, 100 samples up to 150 samples, sort of doubled the number of EQTL uh, they mm. might have identified. Mm. And the ones that you detect become more stable to more likely to replicate. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, so there's a lots of things that we can do to build uh, on this. Um, you know, I'm aware that this is just, you know, an initial thing, but hopefully it will be uh, helpful to people. Another question, since there's none um, open yet. Um, by how many different mechanisms do you think EQTLs might exert their effect? Right. So if you think about your full list of e-gene, e-SNP relationships, yes. some will be just because it's not, it's, a, it's an LD friend to something that's functional, right? Yeah. Uh, other ones will be very near a promoter and they may just have a typical promoter effect. Others yeah. might be more of a distal thing um, that they might be brought together in three-dimensional space in the usual yeah. way. And it's some sort of enhanced or promoter type thing. Yeah, yeah. Just in terms of like, and obviously, you know, few people have actually really tried to get their heads around what transcription factors do in this particular context. Yeah. So, but it's a really important question. You know, exactly how do you think, and how many different ways do you think the DNA level variation might lead to RNA level variation? Well, many ways. So obviously those that you've described, and they, they, uh, uh, but then of course we have the splicing ones, which may have been picked up by a trans transcript specific EQTL, although, um, you know, the uh, Callisto, you know, annotating them to known, um, to known sort of ensemble transcripts won't get everything. There's going to be a lot there, obviously, uh, uh, Jaffe, Andrew Jaffe and the Libre Institute uh, recently presented paper and they analyse it based on uh, just sort of you know, uh, uh, exon boundaries, so uh, identifying novel ways that it might aberrantly produce different transcripts. Um, our, uh, variation within the mRNA sequence itself is obviously uh, going to affect potentially stability, also microRNA binding. Um, so that would be another mechanism. Um, so there are a whole yeah, slew of mechanisms by which a variant can affect gene expression. I think it's very, it is important to work out those mechanisms, um, but I think, I think really the most important thing for us is to know which genes, which transcripts of those genes, and how and when they're affected. I think that's the real thing we need to know um, to, to you know, further our real understanding of, uh, of, of psychiatric disorders rather than gene regulation in general. Got it. And then, and then if you think, uh, if you think about um, all the different mechanisms, what's going to unify them? So presumably there's, there's some program that, you know, you know, 
if it impacts EQTLs to actually change expression, but it won't just happen one gene at a time. It'll happen across some set of genes. Yeah. So yeah. how do you actually, what, what's the thread that might tie some of these different mechanisms together? Well, some, some of these variants, I mean, some of them will be, will be selected for, of course. Some of them will be just sort of being carried along and drifting in the population, but I think mm -hmm. some of them will be selected for, and you may have a variant that, um, that affects one gene. Actually, you know, it's quite possible, and I think a lot of enhancers obviously operate on more than one gene at a time, uh, and these variants, therefore, in enhancers, which a lot of these distal uh, associations will be uh, will be uh, affecting multiple uh, genes simultaneously, uh, and it may be that uh, your risk gene or your your risk gene may itself the change in expression may be advantageous in certain circumstances, but it may be carried alongside something else that's advantageous. Uh, there's a huge many huge number of ways I think that uh, these could um, these could obviously uh, exist. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you I'm so much. Sure if I could. I no. could in, in, yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's like all this stuff, you know, as soon as we yeah. learn something, it, it, it engenders several more questions. And that's yeah. kind of where we are right now with this, I think. Absolutely. Okay, there's no more open questions that I can see. Um, but I, I'm sure that uh, all of the 40 to 45 people that were live in this call uh, will join me in thanking you for taking the time to speak to us today. Fantastic talk. Nick, thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. All right. That's it, everybody. Thank you very much. Cheers, all. Thank you. Bye.